Our next presentation is a panel discussion entitled The Impact of Linked Data in Digital Curation and Application to the Catalogers Workflow. It'll be presented by Stacey Boileau, Jenny Jing, Aaron Tripp, Ian Bigelow, and Danielle Iman. Stacey Boileau is entering her third year at OCLS. Stacey has a unique role in which she sits on both the service and technical team with a hand in many initiatives and projects that involve both core and opt-in services for Ontario colleges. She spends a great deal of her time on ILS support and has become deeply involved with the metadata standards of the college's union catalog. Jenny Jing has more than 10 years of experience working as the systems librarian in different organizations, including Queen's University, Harvard Business School, United Nations, and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Her experience includes migrating ILS systems, building library IR, and digital repositories. Erin Tripp is a business development manager for an open source software services company, though she's also trained as a librarian and as a journalist. She's worked on dozens of digital repository projects and is happy to share her experiences with linked open data at Access 2015. Ian Bigelow is a cataloger for Georgian College and is the current chair of the Bibliographic Standards Working Group for Ontario Colleges. He has bachelor degrees in mathematics and classical studies from Laurentian University and Western University, where he also completed his MLIS. Daniel Neiman has been a cataloger systems, systems technician from Loyalist College, Belleville, Ontario for over 25 years. Daniel is past chair of the Ontario College's Bibliographic Standards Working Group and currently serves as the chair of the Metadata Working Group, one part of the technical task force for the college's ebook consortium. Originally a graduate of Sheridan College and more recently of Athabasca University, Danielle has a continuing interest in our changing relationship with communications technologies and is passionate about keeping resources discoverable as we move from one environment to the next. Please join me in welcoming Stacy, Jenny, Aaron, Ian, and Danielle. Thank you for coming to our presentation. Um, how can I do this? <laughs> okay. Okay. Information organizations and systems in libraries are in a state of significant flux. Linked data and the semantic web have become buzzwords. But what is linked data? And why it is important for libraries? How can we use it in digital curation? And what can libraries do to prepare for this change in their current practice? To my knowledge, there are three groups of library staff who work closely with technology and data, and their concerns are different. For library managers, their focus on strategy and resource. The metadata team and the IT staff, their focus on the skills needed and workflow. So in our presentation, I'm going to cover the first group's concern, what and why about linked data. And Aaron is going to talk about linked data from an IT systems perspective related to digital repositories using Eilindora as an example. And the catalogers team is going to cover the metadata part of the linked data. In general, there are three layers of system, and they are the interface, the system, and the data. Each of them require different skill sets and workflow. To simplify this, the interface is like a tree which above the ground. That's what the public usually see. And the system is like the whole body of a tree which include the parts under the ground. And that's the system's librarians work mostly. And what about the data? I think the data is the water inside of the tree. Try to, if we try to visualize the data, they are the fruit of the tree, and they are what the user actually want. Linked data is actually telling the computer to have its data for us 
and deliver the data to the user so that user can create their own applications and make their own product using the data we published. So what is linked data? It's introduced by the semantic web. The, semantic, the goal of the semantic web is to make raw data accessible on the web and that the web itself become a kind of database. It improves the way we discover, access, integrate, and use data. Link data is a method of publishing structured data so that it can be interlinked and become more useful through semantic queries. There are four principles of linked data, and here they are. The most important thing is the triple, and here is a diagram about triple. So why it is important for libraries? Librarians, we are the people who put information in information technology. Without the information, IT is just a T. Currently, I think we focus, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but think about it. I think as the system IT guys, currently we focus a lot on the technical system part of our work, but a little bit behind the data part. But that's what the user want, and that's our identity. That's how we di differentiate ourselves with IT. And digital curation and linked data, I think there are three, uh, three types of library systems, software, platform, infrastructure. And the digital curation part, mostly in the infrastructure part. But the challenge for us is, how can we bring traffic to those systems and add authority control and catalog them, help the user find them? So here comes linked data. Linked data can bring web traffic, increase data reuse, provide authority control for free, and using BigFrame, maybe we can save some time on editing the records. <coughs> if we think data is like water, then the different forms of the data are like different forms of water. For mark record, I think it's like ice. It's not flexible to be transferred, accessed. In my experience, while I worked at HBS, we uh, migrate from Voyager to Olive. So we, uh, it's a one-year project. I learned a lot. We clean up data. I, I feel like we were cleaning up an iceberg. <laughs> it's true. And for RDF, it's like the liquid format of water. It's more flexible because you can define your own, your own schema. That's one example I did at HBS. We invited two early book authors. One helped us develop the schema, which you see now, and the other was helping us to build in the interface using the language I'm not familiar. That whole broad project, I feel like I'm trying to climb up a hill with, without enough knowledge. That's back in 2009. And now we have linked data. So this is one project I did at Sloan Canyon Cancer Center. That's their first institutional repository, which covered 2,000 authors who published articles in this area. So when we started, we extracted the records from five different resources. And the most time consuming part for my work is trying to map the author's name we got from different places. That's what I feel. So the last thing I will talk about is linked data, the life cycle. The first thing is extraction. You, you extract the data from your local resource, whether structured data or not structured. And then querying. Querying could be um, useful in the whole life cycle because you need to check your data frequently. And then authoring, interlinking, enrichment, NSS, evaluation, and discovery. 
I put a link in my slides so you can learn all the details later on. I hope I didn't take too much time. And here are real projects in uh, using linked data in digital curation. And Erin is going to talk about the sample site in Eilidora. And I think we just passed the ice age and we are entering <laughs> the water age. Do we have the enough skills, systems, to deal with the storm, data storm? And then what's coming is a cloud. So I think we need to get prepared and provide service using data. And because that's what we are, we are librarians. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I'm Erin Tripp. I'm a librarian, as was noted in the introduction. I've been working in digital repositories for about five years, um, primarily in the Island or community. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I work for an open source software services company based in Charlottetown called Discovery Garden. So for the most part, I'm guessing a lot of you know what Islandora is. If you don't, it's an open source a software uh, digital repository framework. And it, uh, it uses Drupal, Apache Solar, and Fedora Commons to build digital repositories. Um, essentially, Fedora is where we organize and store information. So I'm going to be focusing on Fedora for this small case study. I'm only going to be up here for a couple minutes. Um, so in Fedora, we essentially have objects that are made up of a couple of pieces of information. We have persistent or unique identifiers, we have metadata, and in most cases, we have files. Um, we also have relationship information. So this happens in, in Fedora by default. Relationships are stored in what's called RDF XML, and that is um, along the lines of uh, linked open data principles. Um, so Fedora Commons, creates and stores relationship information by default, um, but it, it, it assumes that you have to create those relationships sometimes manually, and the case study I'm gonna be talking about is a custom case study where we automated a lot of the linking that went, ha that went on. So uh, the example here is the TU Delft repository. I tried to include bit.ly links in a lot of these slides in case you want to navigate to the repository live. Um, so this repository was built at uh, the Delft University of Technology, also, I guess, better known as TU Delft, and it houses information about colonial architecture and town planning. So the big, if anyone uh, here is familiar with the Dutch, they love their architecture. So the um, architecture faculty at TU Delft is actually uh, one of the largest at the university, and um, they really wanted to create this rep repository to remove barriers to comparative research. So LOD principles were at the center of the planning and ex execution of this repository, and they knew that they were going to have to do some custom development in order to achieve that. Um, Discovery Garden was involved in this project, so we worked, we kind of liaised with the Faculty of Architecture and the TU Delft um, Library. So they actually have some wonderful staff, very skilled developers on staff. So they just, um, they asked for our help as needed. So they did some of the development or most of the development in house and asked us to automate some of the other processes for them. All right, so let's check out a person object. So um, you, I, I wish it was a little bit larger, but anything in green on that person object display is a link to rather, well, it's actually a link to an object in the repository. So the goal here was to represent things that are being ingested into the repository as objects, so it's an atomistic model. Everything is an individual object that is linked to other objects. The thing that was a little unique about this is that they also have external services represented it as objects in the repository. So um, worth noting is they decided to work with the external service, the Getty AAT thesaurus, is the Arts and Architecture thesaurus. Um, they also wanted to work with geo names, so they wanted everything mapped on a map. Uh, they wanted uh, to be able to see a building that someone had architected or planned, and they wanted to see the building record plus a map of where it is. Um, they also have geographic uh, information about where architects were born, died, went to school, that kind of thing. So um, what happened, uh, what we wanted to do essentially is to call to these external services and then represent them in the repository. 
So the nice thing about um, displaying related information in this way is it really does have the potential to facilitate and enhance um, comparative research. And that was the main goal, and we feel that the project was successful in, in facilitating that goal. Um, it also has the potential to generate and encourage the discussion about the significance and management of the data. So when we are able to see related things together, it just has more context, it has more meaning, and um, people pay more attention to it. It's easy to use. And one thing you'll note is that the actual repository interface does not show information in a graph like this. That wasn't a real objective of the Faculty of Architecture. They really just wanted object records that were hyperlinked. So this is actually built in Fedora 3, and so um, Fedora 3 doesn't have an easy Sparkle endpoint, so they didn't need real-time exporting to a graph-like uh, viewer or interface. So for them, this worked for them, but in Fedora 4, there will be um, more readily accessible, or there will be more accessibility to the triple so that they can be displayed in this type of way. Um, just so, uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about the structure here, there are content types, and most of these are custom, actually, for all types of objects in the repository. So buildings, maps, images, uh, films, documents, persons, or people, organizations, and then those external services I mentioned. Um, so the, the process of ingesting these objects, so the ingest would happen for all of the objects other than the last two. Um, repository objects that are created for the external, external services happen automatically. So everything uh, above the last two items in this list uh, would all be ingested by someone at the library. Um, and also, you'll notice the, the building record here. The user experience is, is pretty typical. I mean, if you were to uh, click on the AAT concept that's highlighted in green, you would essentially just go to a record for that concept, and then below that would be all objects in the repository linked to that concept. So it's really what you would expect from from a typical interface. There's nothing, uh, nothing weird going on here. So um, you can imagine, if we were trying to automatically link all of these objects together, it would be awful. You'd be spending an awful lot of time um, you know, in your mods records and then having to update your RELSX data stream, which is where relationship information is stored in Fedora 3. So what we ended up doing for Delft is uh, creating what we call the Delft Dora module. It's like a weird thing. We called everything Aura uh, at the end. So we called uh, this the Delft Dora module. <laughs> and um, it essentially automates the process as much as possible. So the first step is the process, it looks for concept identifiers in records. Um, so they actually used FOF or their version of FOF, which they called SFOF. Um, and so it's looking for identifiers in the records. Step two is if an identifier is found, there's a process run to call the external service. In these cases, it would be the Getty AAT thesaurus or it would be um, the GeoName service. It would return information about that concept. The third step is creating an object in the repository you know, to represent uh, that external service. And then the fourth step is essentially updating the RDF XML for all related objects that have been referenced in that original record that was um, ingested by a staff member. So it takes a lot of the, uh, the manual work out of the, the entire process. Um, one thing I don't get into in this presentation is the indexing implications of this and also the display implications of this, but just noteworthy is that there were additional indexing requirements um, for displaying and searching all of these linked concepts as well. So the result of this um, Delft Dora module and the, process, the processes that it run um, would be a record like this. So essentially the um, RDF XML is going to, it's going to combine things that were entered into the record by the staff person and also links that were created automatically by the system. Um, so from this record we can see it represents a person, they have a unique identifier, um, there are variations on the person's name that was entered by the, per the staff person. Um, there are external links to information resources. This is also something that would have been entered by the person ingesting the asset in or uh, an object into the repository. Uh, we know that this person was born in Abs Amsterdam in 1856, died in The Hague in 1934. And he studied at two universities, one in Switzerland and the other in the Netherlands. Uh, we also know that he's defined or tagged as an architect and urban designer. So um, 
there is a combination here of manually entered information and uh, automatically generated information. So, I mean, really the approach, whatever happens in the background, the, the approach and the way that it's presented to the user essentially makes it more intuitive to use. It makes it easier to discover. And I feel that anything, anytime something is easier to discover, it's, it encourages reuse. Um, they, and really central to the TU Delft use case was they wanted to make sure that they were removing all barriers possible. And they feel that it was successful. Um, this project, worth noting, like I said, this project was built in Fedora 3. Um, the way that things will change in Fedora 4 is that the, uh, the relationship information will be stored in a different format, so there will be migration or a migration involved there. Also, um, the, the triples will be easier to access in real time through the Sparkle endpoint, so those will be really terrific improvements. Um, this has been in production for over a year, so it was, it was built in three. Um, but I imagine there will be plans for more institutions to do more linked open data uh, projects in Fedora 4. So if you're looking for more information on this project, please vis visit the links here. Um, I, took, I took files from a project manager at TU Delft. His name is Fritz, and he gave me permission to use those files. But I have linked to his more in-depth presentation there. So if you are interested in learning more, um, Fritz's presentation is wonderful. So thank you. Hello everyone, um, as noted in the introductions, my name is Ian Bigelow. I am a cataloger at Georgian College and the current chair of the Bibliographic Standards Working Group for the Ontario, Col Ontario College System. So, yes, that's right, the secret cataloging police are here. <laughs> and we're, we're looking for someone named Thomas Guignard, implicated in a presentation on disintegration. I don't know if anyone's seen him. <laughs> but, um, Seriously, I am also a cataloger who's very much aware of the, the current state of change and flux in, in metadata, and I'm very excited about it and the opportunities that it presents. Uh, it may even be that, that soon uh, we might want to be thinking about planning for disintegrating MARC. And um, at the same time, however, we do need to respect uh, our current operating environment. and, and sort of the creation of bibliographic metadata at the ground level. And in that regard, I'd like you to welcome you to Jurassic Mark. <laughs> so this happy fellow is a, a dinosaur, more specifically a toy Tyrannosaurus rex and one of my daughter's favorites. And, and working with, with Mark can be uh, compared very much so to playing with dinosaurs. Mark really is very long in the tooth. Um, and so if it sometimes seems like it's designed for a previous era and very ancient, well, perhaps it can be forgiven because it is. But at the same time, I think we have to acknowledge that its longevity has more to do with its strengths. Uh, let's face it, how many other encoding standards have been around for 40 plus years? And I, I say that because I think it's worth considering uh, both for librarians and catalogers and developers, um, people working with linked data, to respect it as we move forward, because it's got quite the bite, and we need to make sure that it's sort of some of the concepts are preserved as we move along. However, enter linked data. In contrast, linked data will be a new reality for libraries, at least I think so, uh, and recently, Catalogers in Ontario colleges and internationally have implemented RDA, Resource Description and Access. And thankfully, this gives us something uh, of a bridge into linked data. However, only if we really embrace some of the principles behind it that focus on linking and relationships. And so in the creation of the new uh, OCLS cataloging workflow, uh, we really felt that it was time to mark the importance of linked data in the process. Um, throughout the development of it, we found a, a constant tension between trying to outline current practice, and when I say current practice, I'm including RDA in that, uh, as well as planning for, for future changes. 
Uh, so we tried to take some small steps in adapting practice uh, for linked environments and, and linked data. Now, as we were kind of in the thick of things working on this workflow, we also came across an article by Seaman and Goddard, which asked the question, in, in short, what can present day catalogers do to prepare the way for future data needs? And this really, really resonated with us because it was exactly what we were trying to work on. But at the same time, it's also a very tricky question. Because on the one hand, we have to accept that Mark will be around for some time to come. Let's face it, libraries have a lot of Mark. It's widely implemented and still in current use. But at the same time, Mark will likely either drastically evolve, or I think perhaps more likely be replaced. So we kind of took two uh, basic approaches in trying to address those considerations. One was to provide instruction in the workflow to use Mark, uh, sorry, to use uh, RDA in Mark environments and examples, but in a more modular way, so that in the future we'll be able to lift out the Mark from the workflow. Now, part of this uh, was to do with what had to do with the bibliographic standard working group's mandate to, to look towards future developments, but it was also partly practical. We don't want to have to redo our documentation in a few years because it's a timely process. So hopefully, being able to lift that mark out and replace it with other instruction or keep it as an encoding neutral document may put us in good stead for the future. We also really tried to build on training for within the workflow for RDA, Berber, authorized access points, and in general trying to really uh, change the emphasis for training catalogers from describing records to describing discrete data elements that can be interlinked. Now, there's been a lot of change lately. Uh, recently, as I said, RDA has been implemented as a new international uh, content standard. And now we're talking about changing our encoding standard as well. So lots to think about, but let's not panic. On one hand, Mark is not completely disjoint from linked data concepts, and I suspect some, some may call me on that and try to argue the point. Uh, but broadly speaking, if you do, um, describe a resource with RDA in, in Mark, there's still a lot of discrete data elements linked with relationships. And those can be extracted and marked up or uh, transformed into RDF such that they can be published to the web. Uh, linked data will probably also come in stages. Currently, most of libraries' bibliographic metadata is in Mark. In the, the present to near future, um, there's perhaps a higher opportunity for Mark to be transformed into RDF or marked up with schema.org. Um, and uh, other kinds of transformations of our existing data. And in the, perhaps, I don't want to say further in the future, a little bit more in the future, library metadata may, may well be native to the web. So we don't need to really panic, but we do need to start working with Mark in such a way that we build future compatible metadata. And for that matter, future, future compatible catalogers. Because when this technology really hits, we don't want to have to start planning for that, those kind of considerations then, because that will be quite the steep learning curve. Now, I've included this slide just to give people an idea that change in um, linked data for libraries is coming perhaps quicker than we might have expected, or some, quicker than some may have expected. Um, this example is just for the LibHub initiative that's put out by Zafira, and Denver Public Library has recently had their collection exported and published online such that you can search for it in Google or other search engines of your choice, and it'll pull up their, their collections directly in search results. And they tend to come up quite high in some of the search listings. It's still quite experimental. You play with it if you want, see what you get, but it, it shows that some of this is happening. And this is just one example. I don't want to advertise for Zafira. I mean, OCLC has done a lot of research. Um, there's been all kinds of projects internationally, and I've included I won't cover those now, but we've included a sort of a, a slide of some resources that people can link out to if they want to on our slide deck sort of towards the end. So with that, I'll pass the presentation over to Stacey Boileau, who will sort of cover the project in general a bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to tell you a bit about OCLS, uh, we were first established in early 2009 as a nonprofit corporation 
to provide support for the libraries and learning resource centers of Ontario's 24 publicly funded colleges. Uh, we bring a suite of centrally funded core services for the benefit of all 24, amongst other opt-in and professional services. Uh, one of these core services is the hosting and maintenance of the College's Union Catalog, CUC, a publicly available shared resource comprised of bibliographic records drawn from the College's libraries. Oh, sorry. The CUC upholds a high standard of bibliographic record by ensuring that additions to the catalog meet minimum requirements. OCLS provides this service under the direction of the College's Union Catalog in Libraries Digital Repository Steering Group. Under the CUC LDR Steering Group, uh, tasked with making sure these standards meet the needs of the colleges and remain up to date, OCLS works with the Bibliographic Standards Working Group, a representative, representative group of various colleges and systems. Within the 24 colleges, we have a variety of college sizes, therefore a range of local capacities when it comes to resources. So back in 2012, with the approaching changes to the cataloging standard from AACR2 to RDA, the joint RDA subcommittee was formed to assist with the implementation of RDA in the colleges. In tandem with individual local college efforts, the joint RDA subcommittee set upon the work of redefining our minimum standards, organized an awareness campaign, and provided some RDA training for college library cataloging staff. One of the last mandates for this group is to replace the old cataloging manual written back in 2010 with a workflow that reflects the new cataloging standard. Here to speak more on the process and approach to the OCLS cataloging workflow and the former chair of the joint RDA subcommittee is Daniel Eman. Hi there, everybody, and good morning. Before I, I go too far, I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that we have other Bibliographic Standards Working Group team members in the audience, and I'd like to acknowledge their, their support and participation in this project as well. Irene and I, Rosina, I, I know you're here somewhere, and I haven't had a chance to, to chat yet this morning, but, but uh, thank you so much for your support. When we were introducing RDA to the colleges, the Bibliographic Standards Working Group identified a number of goals. Of course, the, the, um, the need for training was ever present, and our old uh, mark-driven manual was sorely outdated. It placed um, a heavy emphasis on description at what, n what we now um, call the manifestation level, and somewhat less emphasis on promoting the cataloger to, and prompting the cataloger to build on relationships that are so important to a linked environment. So. Um, uh, Jenny was talking about the iceberg earlier, um, earlier in our session now, and now, we're, of course, we're going to thaw out our workflow as well. So, um, finally, the other problem, in addition to the uh, old manual that we were using, is our widespread use of templates that we all use with our, within our ILS as well. Um, caused us to, or prompted us to focus on a very linear mark-driven workflow, and, um, and that was uh, a problem because we were focusing on, on the manifestation in hand. And, and Stacy, I realize I haven't uh, moved this slide along, so um, just, just very, very quickly, our initial problem was, was um, introduction of a workflow in a MARC environment and, and asking ourselves what we can do to move to a linked environment and how we can adapt our workflow um, to accommodate RDA. So uh, we asked ourselves some questions. Could we provide an updated manual or workflow that would help frontline staff further understand and adopt the underlying Ferber model from which RDA was developed? So that was one question we asked ourselves. Now, um, our systems are, are MARC-based systems, and inspired by work done by LC and other organizations, could we develop a manual that would support a Ferber-based workflow when the existing encoding environment was lifted away? So those are the first two questions we asked. Our 
Our journey took us through many virtual and face-to-face -face roundtables and discussions and a couple of iterations before we really felt that we had a flow we could work with. Our group was inspired by work done by Cambridge Library, British Library, and of course the Pan-Canadian Working Group, and there are many members who have helped us along the way there. We initially tried to create a workflow that described FERPA group one, two, and three elements and found it to be choppy, um, prone to duplication of effort from one FERPA group to the next. And, and for us, it took the flow out of workflow as well. So next, we tried arranging our workflow by describing elements of manifestation first, then building appropriate um, relationships for work and expression. Again, all right. Um, and of course, we were prompting ourselves to build those relationships that are important in a linked environment, but we still weren't quite there. Some in our group asked the question, could we present our workflow in a way that would help us prepare for cataloging in linked environments? And this is the big thing, so we're going to shake things up a little bit now. Um, a WAMI approach was, it was adopted in recognition of its future potential for a workflow for workflow advantages in linked environments. So yes, we're still using our templates, we're still in a MARC environment, but we're changing those thought processes a little bit. So now we don't want to, to jump and describe the, the resource in hand with, with just um, that viewpoint. What we want to do is to ask those big questions first. And we want to describe the work first, then add any elements for expression that we need to add, and describe the manifestation last. And along the way, at each step, what we're doing is recording access points, and we're, we're recording relationships, and we're getting ourselves ready for adding those elements that are necessary for um, continuing on in the linked environment. This is a broad, very broad strokes diagram right here. Um, again, um, we, we start with the work. I'm certainly not showing you all of the steps that we have here because um, it, it would just be um, maybe a little bit too much to look at. But again, um, the workflow asks us, or we're asking our, our st upfront staff to ask those big questions first. So we're saying, what is the work that we're cataloging? Is the title of the resource in hand unique, or is there a preferred title that needs an access point? Because now we're saying, okay, what other links do we need to establish as we're starting to set up um, th this, this and catalog this particular resor resource? So describe the wor work, create an authorized access point, record relationships for the work. Then build on that add our elements for expression, create our access point for expression, and add any relationships for expression that apply. Then further describe manifestation, add those access points as needed, and relationships. And then of course we deal with the item at the local level as well as per our local policies. I'm going to briefly touch on some of the pros and cons for this approach, and I'll leave it to Stacey and Ian to elaborate. We do expect some upcoming hurdles. Um, the current catalog records are he heavily describe elements of manifestation. Um, our flow in, in the past hasn't, hasn't really asked or prompted our cataloger to, to consider the, the broader picture. And um, so, so the, the, that, that orientation really does cause us to, to keep our head in the, uh, in the MARC paradigm as well. Our templates, systems, coding environments currently use to reinforce that linear MARC-driven approach as well. So we're really asking people to, to, to move uh, um, into a different thought process. Our pre-cat process as well. Uh, we're checking for cataloging copy. We're trying to see if we have another item in the collection. And, and we, we very heavily dwell on those items of manifestation as well. And what we want to prompt catalogers to do is to, to shift view to, to um, work broad and then narrow down to, to the individual resource in hand. 
So we know upcoming hurdles because we're in a mark wrap or it is what it is, but we, we can hopefully start to, to jumpstart a bit of a different mindset here. And of course our templates as well are, are going to, to um, prompt us to fall in place in that old mark-driven workflow. And again, we're trying to, to sort of uh, um, thaw that, Jenny. I'll pay tribute to, to, to that. And, and Thomas, where are you? You're somewhere back there. We're, we, are, we are truly trying to disintegrate a little bit and with our thought processes. Um, it, it's going to take a while. But we do see some benefits. So um, because we are prompting catalogers to ask what relationships are important as a catalogers resource, is this title unique? And you need, do I need to, um, what other links do I need to create? This is all very, very important to a linked environment. Yeah. We're also um, asking catalogers to um, pay attention to relationships, and we want to reinforce the use of authorized access points. As we move towards a linked environment, we hope to support the eventual shift in focus from transcribing to building relationships. And again, I'll make reference to the Seaman and Goddard, Goddard article, preparing the way, creating future compatible cataloging data in a transitional environment. Um, well we do have a number of other resources that, that um, we've used and, and have a uh, bibliography that we can share at some point if anybody's interested. I'm going to shift gears now and let St Stacy and Ian take you through the workflow in a little bit more detail. Based on previous surveying of the college needs and requirements, we knew the workflow had to be available online as well as print. The online version will be uploaded to the RDA toolkit as a global workflow, while the print will be available to download on our public cataloging forum space. We also knew it had to be inclusive of all common physical formats available at college libraries, not just print materials. Therefore, we decided on these 10 different formats. Uh, furthermore, we needed the workflow to not only map out a process for catalogers, but to serve as a reference for consortial policies and for training new or frontline staff. We are hoping to be able to demonstrate the workflow in action within the RDA toolkit, uh, but are not quite finished with the final edits and linking, so these are just screenshots to give you a sneak peek of the workflow design and structure. Uh, we chose a step-by-step -step workflow that took into account not only the WEMI structure, but the type of cataloging required. So depending on whether you were doing copy, derivative, or original cataloging, you would have a prescribed treatment for the workflow. Uh, the treatments are outlined in the beginning of the How to Use Guide that also serves as a short checklist. This gives the cataloger an immediately visible workflow which can be referenced throughout to keep them on the right track or to make sure the record in front of them is complete. In the workflow, the WEMI structure is represented in step five through eight of an eight-step process with the attributes of the WEMI elements being the baby steps in between. These attributes are outlined in an index in the beginning of each WEMI step element for easy reference and use, particularly for the print document, which will almost be 300 pages. Here is the basic design structure for each attribute of an element. In this case, it's the title proper. Like the RDA toolkit design, each attribute title is accompanied by a linked reference to the RDA rule, the attribute definition, as well as the source of information for that attribute. Since bibliographic records still live in a MARC environment, a link to the appropriate MARC field in MARC 21 for bibliographic data has been added. Although MARC 21 is not the driving force behind the structure, it is still referenced in examples and mapped to RDA, remaining on the edges where it can be easily removed when the time comes. At the beginning of each attribute step, we indicate whether it is a required attribute both as RDA core and consortially. For example, to uphold the standard of the union catalog, we have an API filter called the minimum edit, which looks for certain minimum requirements of a record. If the record does not have the mark fields, it will not be accepted into the union catalog, so this information is important and is up front. Following is instruction on how to record the attribute accompanied by examples when necessary and a special note for when OCLS consortial policy applies. 
Each attribute ends with examples of each of the applicable physical formats and any format-specific instructions. In this case, the attribute is duration and only applies to DVDs, streaming video, CD CDs and audio, and streaming audio. And an, and an example is given for each. Furthermore, unlike a maze where there is only one way in and one way out, the OCLS cataloging workflow has several different entrance points. Yes, a cataloger can start at the beginning and work their way to the end, but they can additionally enter through the how to use guide or the mark index, which maps each mark field to an RDA attribute and a step in the workflow. In this way, we hope to not exclude those staff that are still thinking in terms of mark or would like a quick reference. Lastly, the second function for the workflow is the need for it to serve as a reference document. We include write-ups on cataloging tools and standards, give context to the current cataloging environment, and touch upon where we are headed. Consortial policy documents are included, as well as documents from our very own RDA awareness campaign that gives easy explanations on, on RDA-related subjects, such as how to deal with hybrid records. Embedded at the end of each WEMI element step is an example for each of the 10 physical formats that can be followed through steps five to eight with the particular mark fields for each attribute populated. In this way, the cataloger can get a sense of the role each element plays to create a complete bibliographic record. In these ways, the OCLS cataloging workflow strives to be a comprehensive reference and process tool for the colleges that is easy to use, informative, and flexible enough for when a new encoding standard is implemented. To speak more on how we see the future is Ian Bergelow. So what does this all mean for us? I mean, how have we really tried to, to incorporate the influence of linked data within the workflow? I wanted to try to bring that full circle. And I also wanted to, sorry, wanted to fully acknowledge uh, that these are small steps, but they're important ones to start making, uh, to start moving along a, a path that will help us sort of bridge. And the first overall approach is, again, focusing on having catalogers describe discrete data elements rather than um, sort of static textual records, bibliographic records. We also placed a heavy emphasis throughout the workflow on authorized access points, adding identifiers whenever possible, especially if they come in the form of URIs, and leveraging the use of relationships in RDA and MARC wherever possible. Now, I don't know how many of you might have toddlers at home that have a train table in the middle of your living room or perhaps you remember playing with these kind of things as a, as a kid yourself. But when you, break, when you break something down into component parts and ensure that standard established links are used to connect varying sets and pieces, the sky's the limit to the amount of fun you can have. And this is very much what uh, linked data can offer to our, to our metadata. Because if you look at what we're currently doing, and you can imagine in this, in this slide, if the track here is nailed to the table, I didn't actually nail it to the table, my wife would have been upset. Um, but if you imagine that it is, uh, it's essentially what we're doing. It's still a very nice set that a kid could have quite a bit of fun with, but it's really hard to break apart into different pieces. And for that matter, it doesn't link out to other, standard, other standards or, now I'm talking about metadata, metadata stats very well. So this is really what we need to start moving away from so that we can both enrich the content that we have for our users, and so that we can make ourselves more visible where our users are online, and really break away from what we've been working on previously for the past 40 years. So the other big focus that we had working through the, the workflow was on relationships, authorized access points, and identifiers. And once we release the document, uh, you'll be able to go through and see how it's, that's populated throughout. But we also took a, a really comprehensive approach to outlining um, how, to, how to use relationships uh, in the process of joining those authorized access points with identifiers and interlinking them with relationships. And I've included this example to try to, to, try to bring it together. Um, the first little bit with the white background uh, showing the mark 
if there's any catalogers in the, in the audience, you'll probably see some interesting things going on there. And without getting into that in too much detail now, some of the identifiers that we're, we're showing here for training purposes mainly, and we make that quite clear in the workflow, are hard to express in market present. But still, it's, it's worth starting to, to outline how that can, how that can all work. Because in, in this case, we've got a work linked data for libraries, and you've got uh, OCLC uh, work identifier URI form with it. And we've got a relationship designator, which uses controlled vocabulary, uh, turn it to inmark. And that can be mapped out to the Library of Congress linked data surface, which has URI identifiers for it. And of course, you've got the, the author, Hulan Sethan, who, of course, has a authority file of the Library of Congress, and so is in the Library of Congress linked data service. Again, another URI. And if you bring those together, you've got linked data for libraries, has author, Hulan Sethan, and that starts to look an awful lot like a triple. Uh, now, in the workflow, we don't take catalogers at the moment through the process of working in RDF or trying to generate triples. Of course, we're still in the Mark wrapper. But what we're trying to do is really encourage the creation of these relationships as much as we can within our current operating environment so that if our data down the road is then uh, transformed into RDF, uh, it'll be more useful, for one, easier to map. And for that matter, the catalogers, as they work through the, the workflow, will be able to get that sort of conceptual, conceptual background in the kind of data that we're going to be recording and that kind of thing. Because essentially we're, we're, we're changing tracks, if we use the, the same rail analogy. Not just transferring to a different track, but replacing the infrastructure altogether. And we really want to be prepared. Um, because we really don't want, looks like there's a bit of a train wreck on the slide with the part B there. But we really don't want, want option A. Um, we want things to move, move quite uh, smoothly when some of this technology does come down in perhaps fuller force. Um, it's usually better to start planning for some of these things well in advance because if catalogers aren't ready and if our metadata hasn't been prepared, it's going to be a lot, a lot bumpier ride uh, as things come through. Now, that's what I have. I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank Aaron and Jenny for their presentation. They did a great, great job of sort of outlining some of the background for linked data and providing a great case study with respect to one repository. And we wanted to acknowledge some of the other people involved in the creation of the OCLS cataloging workflow. Because we've just had the privilege of presenting on it, but there's been a lot of other people involved in the process. So without spending a huge, huge amount of time going through it all, I wanted to put the slide up and say thank you to them all for all the time and effort. And with that, if anybody has any questions for anyone on the panel, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Anyone at all? Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, the uh, ILS system that you're you're working with does it, is it amenable to all of these uh, fields and so on? Uh, it, that's somewhat of a tricky question because the the workflow we're creating is for the Ontario College system, and there's multiple ILSs, of course, across that system. But in, in general, that's, that's a tricky thing because no, they're not amenable to it at all. Um, in some regards, that's how, how some of these, these concepts, we're really treating it as a, a training concept. And that's why we still have to work with Mark and give that instruction within the workflow. At the same time, giving that, that background training that will help people sort of get the concept a bit more. But part of the other, the other side of that question, I think, is that so, some of this, in general, RDA cataloging in the past maybe hasn't been treated, been treated as well as it could. In general, as catalogers, I think we tend to focus on our manifestations. We have a, a book in hand or a resource in hand 
that we have at our desk and we work away at from the manifestation level or down perhaps to the item level. And by the time you get to some of the authorized forms, you've already kind of done a lot of your description and maybe we don't pay enough attention to some of the authorized access points and relationships. So that was one of the driving factors in why we sort of flipped things and started with outlining work, expression, manifestation, and item, so that people really dive in with some of the, the big questions, outlining preferred titles, uh, generating the authorized access points for the work and expression, and um, creators and such. my hand up to see what that was. Uh, no, I actually do have a question. I tend not to use it. Um, can you speak a bit to the issues of time lapse? I mean, oh, they, and I need yeah. it because, oh, sorry. Can, uh, can you speak a bit to the issue of timelines? Um, uh, think of your, uh, your initial image of the, um, of the dinosaur, and I thought, well, what, what are the timelines going forward on, on uh, linked data or uh, more specifically uh, bib frame? Is there anyone in the audience who could answer that for me? <laughs> um, I don't know. The, there, is, there are examples of some of the, some libraries who are starting to take their mark records and export them through, for instance, the LibHub initiative with Safira and having them converted into RDF and go online. It's still very experimental, but that seems to be moving along quicker. How, how fast we might get to having our metadata in a native online environment, I have no idea. Uh, uh, if there's anybody with BibFrame here. Uh, Dan, I see your hand up there. You have a thought? <laughs> okay. Okay, oh, I'll leave that. And, you know, OCLC's done a lot of work with marking up with schema.org, and you can sort of go in and see some of their samples uh, at the end uh, of records in WorldCat. I know the, in Europe there's been a lot of little projects working away as well. The timeline, I'd like to know. I really would. It would help planning a lot. I just know that it's coming. You're starting to see the examples pop up, so it's something to consider. Yes, anybody else here? Um, hi there. going okay so our goal here too is 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 not necessarily to to um, to to give ourselves six months or, or 12 months or you know to to um, to to be in that environment our goal here is is to try to to give everybody an opportunity to to shift their their conceptual flow in, in their head and at their desk so that so that when they are in a position to be in a linked environment and have to be able to to build these relationships, then then they're feeling comfortable and and they've got that that flow going on in their head, and 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 certainly there will be some encoding changes and and there will be some process changes in there, but um, we're looking at the human element too. Does that help? And just just cultivating that 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 bit that's going on in all of our heads as as we do our work at the desk. Yeah, I may have forgotten to mention it in the in my slides, but I think it's it's worth noting that some of these small steps that we're taking we're, we're hoping will help put us in good stead for linked data. There's always the the possibility that linked data for libraries will completely fail. Either libraries will plot along with Mark, or something else will come along. I don't think that's the case. But who knows? If that happens, though, uh, the workflow that we've done, we're hoping, so we're focusing on relations, relationships, authorized access points, and better just creating more robust metadata. So it's kind of win-win because in the end, if linked data doesn't come along, at least we've just got better information for our users that can be used hopefully in other environments too. So I, I have the mic. Sorry. Ah, I have the power. Um, so being a bit of a mark geek and seeing your 024 linking to the uh, WorldCat uh, uh, work identifier um, and thinking about the workflow as it's been presented, I'm wondering how much are you anticipating using APIs like the WorldCat API or others to enrich your records that you already have to help them prepare for 
um, the linked data world. It's crossed our minds. That's, that's about as far as it's gone, um, unfortunately, yeah. I think down the road we will need to, to work with um, with something, but that's going to be a broader group and consortium discussion as well. I mean, I think it would be handy if some of those things could be added in an automated way, obviously. And some tools, you can, you can see examples of how that might work. MarkEdit, which is a program for doing a lot of batch, batch editing for, for cataloging and number of different uh, tools. But there is a, a new option in it specifically that uh, I think under the Mark Next, if anybody's familiar with the program, the Mark Next section of it that allows you to take a, a set of Mark records and it automatically populates some of the subfield zero URI identifiers to name authority headings and subject, subject headings and things so that you can have a standard data set that you might load into your ILS. Now whether what your ILS will do with those at present is perhaps a better question. Um, will it break your authority tables? Will it do a number of different things? So there's a lot of setup that could be involved with that, even if you wanted to even just with have those on your records at present without creating havoc for your users. So that's perhaps one of our next steps is seeing how some of our systems might be able to incorporate that. But. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. That brings us to housekeeping. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel guests. and Sir John Fink for all of his calisthenic work today, handling questions. Uh, so just a couple of things before lunch. I need someone to shout out a letter of the alphabet. L. Okay, I heard an L. The other ones were sort of a blur. Uh, anyone who has a first or last name that starts with an L, stand up. Okay, perfect. Yellow shirt there at the back, sir. If you can come forward, you got it. Yep, smiley there. Uh, what we're doing is we're gonna do the draw for the laptop prize. So anyone else can sit down. Uh, Thank you. So to keep it all on the up and up, I'm having someone from the audience. Thank you very much. I shall, re I shall read it aloud. So before I read this name aloud, I just want to say that there should be, this person should be in the audience right now because it is a physical gift. I have it right here. It's a physical prize. So if this person is not here, that means you shouldn't go too far because I will have someone else draw. <laughs> I will have you draw another name. Is Francis Kawaya here? Yeah, you are. Come on up. So this laptop is courtesy of our friends at the Renewed Computer Technology, and they donated this prize. So thank you very much, Francis. Here you are. I do also want to send a thank you to our Wednesday social reception sponsors, Elsevier and the University of Guelph. Uh, at that, it is now lunchtime. Thank you very much to you all for your patience and uh, persistence this morning as we went through the presentations, and please enjoy lunch. We'll see you back soon. <laughs>